Yes, good evening again. Um, this is our third presentation before you for our downtown parking study. And Dave Burr is here again from Rich and Associates to make a presentation to you on what is, at this point, our draft final presentation of the parking study. Um, we uh, appreciate the fact that this is a rather extensive study. I know you've all been given a copy of it. And we have some new members to the commission. So we, we understand that there's a lot of information to, to absorb and um, to get up to speed with. Um, we have been posting the uh, audio portions of our last meetings along with the PowerPoint presentations on the website for the public to follow along, people who are interested in it. So we haven't had a lot of public attend our meetings, but we have had quite a few people following along, I know, on the website. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Dave, let him give you a presentation. And um, we, we do have it on the agenda. We, if you're comfortable, we would prefer to get a motion tonight in support of the of the study. Um, I understand that you may have some questions or some suggestions to go along with that motion. Um, if you're not comfortable with that, um, we'd be happy to talk more about it and, and see what additional information you might have going forward. I'll Thank turn you. it over to Dave. Thank you. Good evening. Um, what we have for you is, we're not going to belabor the points of some of the other information we presented, but uh, very briefly to review the scope of work of uh, what we were asked to do for this study. Um, the bulk of our presentation is reviewing the findings and the recommendations from that study, and then at the end if you have any questions. Um, our, our scope of work was to, to quantify and qualify the parking uh, supply. And in previous presentations, we, uh, we showed uh, the commission uh, the availability of parking and how that is classified into public and private and the parking on the north and the south side of the railroad tracks. Um, if we exclude the commuter parking, what we showed uh, in, in previous presentations was the uh, uh, village uh, controls only about 45 percent of the parking is publicly available. Uh, the rest of that is privately controlled and really a best practice is you should control about 50 percent. Now in the evening when you have the availability of those commuter spaces, even though they are signed as available after noon, effectively they're not because they're occupied by, by commuters until very late. So we actually pull those out during the daytime hours. Um, we quantified and qualified the parking demand. We calculated what the parking needs were, and in our previous presentation we showed for you what the demand was for the various blocks versus the available supply. And if you, uh, in, in the reports and in the previous presentations, there were blocks that we demonstrated that the demand on that block exceeded the available supply in that block. You had blocks that were in a deficit condition. And so we have some, uh, some recommendations to, to address that. And so we, we showed that and uh, showed what that would be on the north and the south side of the tracks. Now in comparing that demand versus supply, one of the other things that we showed you was um, overall there, there was a surplus of about a, a little over 1,000 spaces. But that includes surplus privately controlled parking that unless you're going to that destination, that parking isn't available. If we pull that out, that 1,000 space surplus actually is down to about 360 spaces. Now that 360 also includes some spaces on street up in the residential areas uh, north of the railroad tracks and in Grove and Carpenter south of the railroad tracks. It's really not convenient parking, parking that folks are going to use. If we pull that out on the north side, we're really getting into a relatively serious deficit or uh, minimal surplus condition of only about a dozen spaces. So it's showing that on the north side of the tracks we actually um, have some uh, conditions where we're going to have to look at some parking in the future and we have some uh, address that in our, in our recommendations. Um, another one of the things that we did in our scope was we did a number of surveys. This provided us the information. Um, we did online surveys of the businesses, uh, residents, uh, those classified themselves as frequent visitors, infrequent visitors, and employees. And we had just under 900 respondents to that. That gave us um, some very useful information. Uh, we did pedestrian surveys um, as part of our turnover uh, during our turnover and occupancy study on two days. Um, and we had just over 1,100 respondents, folks telling us their purpose downtown and those kinds of things. We did the turnover and occupancy counts and we presented to the, to the commission previously. It sh actually showed how the parking was being used within the downtown again, both north and south of the tracks and what the occupancy uh, rates was throughout the day. And our peak was occurring between 12 and 1 o'clock uh, during our weekday periods. 
and we also did a number of stakeholder meetings with bus businesses in the downtown um, set up meetings those folks came and, and met with us and gave us these are business owners property owners we met with them uh, we did personal interviews with about 15 and then there were another six or seven that were not able to meet with us we spoke with them on the phone and got some very useful information all that data collection led to our assessment of a parking what we were asked to look at is the allocation of parking how that's being used and come up with some parking improvements uh, specifically looking at handicap parking or accessible parking loading zones ballet short term uh, look at uh, over the uh, need for overnight parking uh, we looked at enforcement issues and then have uh, again as our scope of our presenting our findings now, I'm not going to go through uh, each of these here, but these are the, there were 13 areas that we looked at um, in, that we have uh, findings and recommendations for, and I'll go through each of these individually. And at the end, we'll kind of summarize these and show you uh, an implementation plan or a, a schedule for these various recommendations. Um, first, on the allocation of spaces, um, as I mentioned, one of the things that our turnover studies found was of the, the privately controlled spaces, only about half of those were occupied at peak time compared to about 75% of the publicly controlled spaces. And again, that's not including the commuter spaces. We pulled those out. Um, so we, we have, uh, and, the, and the, the, the private spaces actually uh, represent a little over half your capacity during the daytime hours. So our recommendation there is to see, seek an opportunity where the village may talk to some of these uh, private landowners and they were thinking perhaps AT&T which has excess capacity or perhaps these churches to enter into an agreement with them and use some of their surplus capacity and perhaps move some commuters into those spaces um, get them out of some of these other areas excuse me on that point would you say that would be a, a discounted parking to incent commuters to park over there versus charging the full monthly uh, the quarterly rate well, I think there's another strategy that Dave will talk about, too, where um, people would pay more the closer they are okay. to the... That so there's some different, some later, different aspects so. of pricing that okay. we can touch on. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the, the second finding was there's um, a perceived shortage of parking. And any, anytime you get about 85% of the parking as being occupied, the perception is the parking is full because now I've got to hunt for parking for a little bit more. Um, and if we include the... The commuter spaces as part of our, our supply during the daytime hours, we're actually at that 85% of our overall public supply occupied during the day. Um, so there's that perception and that real uh, uh, need that, that the parking is short. Um, so a recommendation there is look to uh, convert uh, some of these convert, uh, commuter spaces to downtown shopper spaces. And here we're specifically thinking of lots A or lot B. Now on the, the commuter side of the equation, the you have agreements with Metra to provide, I believe it's 825 spaces, and if we add up the supply in all the commuter lots, there's actually 911 spaces. So you're actually providing 86 more spaces than are required per your agreements with Metra. Does the Metra agreement say where the spots have to be? The um, there's there's 250 spaces in the in the parking garage which are daily fee and the, the, I understand the rate there that is agreement with Metra and then 525 other spaces in surface lots um, someplace in, in some the, it could be in the parking deck too Belmont I'm just Fairview. I'm just asking well is, is it that's just sort of downtown area correct yeah. it, it Fairview or Belmont or not that's yeah not okay not thank you um, so to, to convert some of those spaces, and again, lot A or lot B, to those are, would be uh, useful spaces for shopper parking. Um, lot B, which is right adjacent to the trace station, would provide additional shop, shopper parking at the north end of town. Lot A is the parking on the north side of the tracks right across from Starbucks. And uh, most of that now is, con is considered uh, commuter spaces. Um, and, and what we're trying to do is in, the, in the, the allocation spaces is to try to take the parking that we have and try to use that as effectively as possible. Um, so one of our, our, our next finding was the, by the Village Hall, the lower portion of the parking areas here are gate uh, V or lot V, and the back portion is a gated portion. That is underutilized. Um, on the upper level of the of Village Hall, there's uh, the center module there. Uh, there are some spaces that are allocated to staff parking. We think if we move those staff, 
perhaps down to that gated portion and open up this area on the upper level to perhaps commuter or shopper or employee parking. Um, another finding in the allocation was uh, the 97 percent of the commuters have actually, uh, the morning commuters have actually arrived by 8.30 a.m. and yet you have a restriction that commuter parking is not available until 12 o'clock. Um, there we would like to see perhaps uh, opening, uh, speaking with Metro to see about opening those spaces up prior to that, perhaps as early as 9.30, so that an employee coming in who may start at uh, 9.30 or 10 o'clock, perhaps even a, a, a restaurant staff coming in for lunchtime, those spaces may be available to them. Um, another one of those findings, and this we, we talked uh, from some of our the, the business owners, was there's a, a need for daily fee parking for, for downtown employees. Right now, levels three and four are daily fee parking, and those are filled essentially by 9 o'clock. So an employee, if they have a permit, they can park on level two of the garage. Uh, there's also a few other areas around town where they, they have a permit, but they would have to have that, pay that quarterly permit. Some of the business owners say they don't want to pay that because it might be a part-time employee who only works very infrequently, and so they don't want to, they don't want to have to buy a permit for them. And what we would like to have is parking available for these folks where they can go. Uh, right now, a, the top level of the garage starting at 8 o'clock, uh, there's a daily fee parking up there. Um, and one of the things that we're hearing is some commuters will go up there, they'll park in there before, get on the train at 8 o'clock, they'll, they'll use the pay by phone service and have paid for their parking. Um, there, if we think we made that to late 30, then we might discourage some of that and have some of those spaces available for those, for those employees. Um, when I came into town today, actually, I, I, I drove up to that top level of the garage, and at 2 o'clock, there was only seven spaces available on the top level of a parking garage. Would it make sense to use some of the outlying parking <coughs> for central business employee parking and give it to them for free? Example, the AT&T lot. I know it's a way to walk, but, you know, if they didn't have to pay for it, it would free up space. Just, I don't know if you've take it, taken a look at that or not. Well, our, our, our attitude was um, when, in, in trying to look at some of these, these surplus private spaces, I mean, whether that would be used for commuter parking or employee parking. I mean, it's that, that, I think that would be up to the village discretion. Okay. Um, another one of the issues that we have to look at was handicap parking. Um, handicap parking is subject to federal and state guidelines. And in looking at that, um, the you look at the capacity of a lot and then Based on that capacity, there's a certain number of handicap accessible spaces that must be provided. Um, there's an insufficient number. If we looked at the individual lots, and I think we presented that to you last time, so our recommendation there is you're, overall you're short by about 10 in these public, uh, publicly provided lot, uh, lots to add those 10 handicap spaces. Um, now there's another uh, guideline coming from the United States Access Board that's, that's being, it's been proposed that you may have to consider adding on-street accessible parking. Um, it, it has not been accepted yet, but if it is adopted, uh, then there will may be a need to add some additional handicap parking on street spaces. I just have a comment on the ADA. Um, I think there's value in having ADA on street parking. And a prime example is my wife, who has a hard time walking. We have literally gone from downtown Downers Grove to Westmont because we could not find handicap parking and went to dinner over there because it was much easier. This, as an example. I have a question on that. I use ADA parking, um, but there's parallel parking in town, and I noticed the study doesn't have any um, conditions about reconfiguring. So would ADA parking have to be uh, head-on parking versus, or diagonal versus parallel? No, if, if the post guidelines are adopted for on-street parking, if it is diagonal parking, then uh, there is a, a, it's actually a diagram from the United States Access Board in the report as to how that accessible path right. they can share an aisle. If it is parallel parking, depending on the width of the sidewalk as to how there has to be an access ramp, and I believe if it is uh, 14 feet or under, then it does not, you don't have to reconfigure anything um, on that, but those spaces would have to be placed at the end of the block. If it's wider than 14 feet, the, the sidewalk, then there's some reconfiguration uh, right. configuration would have to do. Since we have curbs, what are those folks going to do who are wheelchair bound and have to ramp onto a... That, there would have to be those ramps. Okay. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. 
Um, time limits uh, for uh, uh, parking downtown. Um, one of the questions that came that we asked during our study was the adequacy of the time limits, um, and most folks seem to agree that uh, the, the entry, and we, we had this in our previous presentation, that the two-hour time limits seem to be adequate for most of them to be able to com uh, complete their business. Um, most of the on-street parking is two-hour parking. Um, there are a few areas that are one-hour parking, but uh, our recommendation is to maintain that two-hour limit for the on-street parking. Um, you do have three-hour off-street in, in the various uh, publicly controlled lots uh, to maintain that for folks that, that uh, need it a little bit longer. And you have four hours in the garage, and our recommendation is to maintain that for those folks that actually need the more time there. If you're over that, then you're into the daily fee spaces. Um, another one of the findings was, and we, there was a number of comments on the, on the surveys on the difficulty of library parking. Um, there are folks coming down, they, you know, it's a great facility we have downtown, and they're coming down, they're trying to bring their children, and that parking lot is full. Um, and so our recommendation there is consider designating some spaces, so perhaps in the central portion of that lot, for 60-minute parking, um, just to encourage more of a, a turnover for, for those folks. Keep, still keep the perimeter of that lot to the, to the three-hour parking. We're not rec uh, recommending we take that away but to shorten some of those spaces for the library. It's folks that need to come into the library, pick something up, and we're going to encourage a little bit quicker turnover for those folks. Is, is go ahead. How many spaces would that be? Um, I don't know exactly. It's the center module. I'd right. have to look at it. OK. Center module. Is, is there any advantage of even going lower, just one or two spaces being 15 or 30 minute parking, somebody that's running in, returning a book, and running back out? There's, 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 that po there's that possibility, absolutely. Um, we were just thinking in terms of the enforcement. Um, I mean, we, what we wouldn't want is that becoming an enforcement nightmare. Right. You know, if the spaces are too short of the library and trying to come to a happy medium as to the folks, you know, that, that need that. And, you know, I'm in, I expect to be 50 minutes. Maybe it takes me a little bit longer if I'm in an hour spot. Yeah. The, the other question, um, it's more of a comment. The library drop box. Mm -hmm is going the wrong way on a one-way street. So in effect, we're either going to force somebody to go the wrong way on a one-way street or we're going to use a parking spot to return books. Would it make sense to change the direction of that one-way street? Now, I don't know if that will or won't help. I don't know why it was placed in the direction it, it is currently for a one-way. But it's, you know, you can't drive up and use the, uh, the drop box. So I would like to see that looked at. I, I don't know why it was put in one way that direction. As a former trustee, I can't even answer that for you. <laughs> it was done for the convenience of the merchants on the uh, on the main street facing uh, east. I would like to see it go the other way because for the, more for the residents, it would make, I think it would free up parking spaces sooner or not even have people use those parking spaces. Sorry. Um, another one of the findings was um, we, we did notice there's, there's quite a number of businesses that, that you have dry cleaners, bakeries, and those types of things that, that may benefit from uh, short-term 10 or 15-minute parking. And so our recommendation there is to consider establishing, uh, not on every block, but on blocks that may have such a need, uh, one or two short-term spaces. And these would be you know, perhaps one space at, at either end of the block, and that's actually a best practice if you're going to have those, those short-term spaces to put them at the end of the blocks. Um, just to accommodate multiple businesses that may have that need. And again, ideally, those spaces are going to turn over a little quicker. It's for someone who needs to come in, you know, run in, pick something up, get in their car and go, and they're going to know that those spaces are at the end of the blocks and, and use those. Would those um, short-term parking spaces be on Curtis? Where would those be? The, 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 at this point, we didn't specify exactly which blocks. We think it's up to the village to determine, you know, and perhaps the DMC working with the businesses as to which would be the appropriate block faces mm -hmm. that have those businesses that might need those spaces. Okay. Um, you know, we don't want to take a lot of spaces out and make them short term, but it's looking where they may be appropriate. So be on a, uh, I guess, case by case basis? Yes. Or for request? Yeah. As far as that goes, I, we keep interrupting you. Um, to me, that I don't, I don't know about that just personally because once we put signage up, it's hard to change. It's not that hard to change, but then you come in front of the commission, and so the pizza place moves or the dry cleaner, and we have this 15-minute parking space. So is that something that you typically see towns doing, like just 
generally spread them throughout, or is it? You know, we, we, we you know see, it makes sense to put it in front of the pizza shop, but. Well, no, you, you, try, you try to put them, and again, best practice is to put them at the end of the blocks. They're signed and coded differently. Um, you know, where we, where um, municipalities that have meters, they'll have that meter as a special color. Well, this may be a, a special type of sign, uh, some to it to identify that it's a short-term space. So would you say it's a best, a best practice to have it? Yes. Um, as I mentioned before, um, future parking um, in, in, in looking at the uh, where you're at today in terms of the capacity, uh, the, the supply versus demand, um, we think at some point there is going to be the need to add uh, additional parking um, to encourage additional uh, investment and development, particularly on the north side of the railroad tracks. Um, and our recommendation here is to begin the process now of starting to build up the fund, and this we'll get into this a little bit more um, in a moment on, on, on some of the uh, uh, economics of the, of the thing, but uh, consider implementing a special service area um, to provide the capital funds. And although we understand you have one now, um, and I'm, I'm not the expert on this, someone else in our office is, but you can provide an overlay area in order to do that, um, to provide the capital funds for additional parking. Um, the, an, another portion of that is um, you know, we saw understand from the, uh, the comprehensive plan we looked at that there are a number of catalyst sites that are identified for future development. Um, there's nothing definite on any, any of those, but uh, some of those sites a developer were to come into the village and, and want to do something, there may be an opportunity for the village to work with them to form a public-private partnership um, to, help, to help provide not only parking for that development but also additional publicly available parking. And again, public parking, someone would park there and be able to visit multiple destinations, not just that development. Um, just an opportunity there. Um, parking enforcement, um, there's, there's excuse numerous me, just, areas. Excuse sorry. me, just a quick question. If we have a residential development, another residential development in downtown business area, is there parking requirements usually that are made part of the zoning or however they get their approval? Yes, there is. And um, our planning manager was at our meeting this afternoon as well, and they are going to be embarking on a review of the zoning code in 2012. Um, as you know, the comprehensive plan was just, was just adopted actually last night by the council, and as a result of that, they're going to be taking a look at the zoning code as well and looking, um, given the information we've gotten from the study um, about the uh, supply and demand for parking in the downtown, they're going to relook at the um, parking requirements for development in the downtown as part of the zoning code. Okay. Thank you. Um, in, in looking at uh, parking enforcement, um, there's numerous areas for the enforcement uh, officer to cover. Um, they're looking not only at downtown but also the Belmont and the Fairview stations. Um, and, and so our recommendation there is consider more random hours and days that that enforcement, um, perhaps, you know, some days uh, they will uh, start a little bit later and uh, spend more time in the downtown and not spend as much time on the permit uh, areas, but it's going to be random so that someone's not going to know when that enforcement officer is coming around. Um, we'll go through the second finding. They start early in the morning and may not extend late enough until the day. Most of your enforcement is, is supposed to be until 6 o'clock, but the enforcement officer may not be working that late. So um, adjusting the hours so that perhaps they can cover those later afternoon hours. Um, right now, the enforcement, um, I mean, our, our recommendations on enforcement, we're not out to, to recommend that parking gets so, that enforcement gets so strict that you discourage people from coming to downtown Downers Grove. Um, you know, we've seen that in some other communities, you know, they just, oh, geez, I'm a, I don't want to go there. If I'm five minutes over, I'm going to get a parking ticket. That's not what we're advocating. What we want is enforcement that discourages the habitual offenders, um, and if someone innocently overstays the limit, then our recommendation would be to consider implementing what we call a, a, a courtesy ticket. Um, if someone comes in, the software and the, and the uh, technology is such that if they haven't received the ticket in the last X number of months, it will tell that to the enforcement officer. They then print off a, call, a courtesy citation that says, thank you for coming to downtown Downers Grove. You know, if you need to stay longer, please use, you know, the off-street parking areas or a lot, and there's no fine attached to that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're not trying to, to upset anybody, but um, just, you know, the understand they, they were enjoying downtown. Um, 
Another one of the findings was, and, and I did observe this, employees who move their vehicle from one space to another. Um, that's really kind of defeating the purpose of the two-hour parking that is really critical to a downtown. Um, so our recommendation there is consider an anti-shuffling ordinance. And we have an example in the, uh, in the report. Um, it can be discourage them from being on the same block face. Uh, I've seen it where it's within a zone that they can be just, they can't park. They may be there for two hours and they have to move out of that zone. Um, conditions of the parking lots. Um, the areas that, that someone parks, is, it's, really, it's really critical that, that they feel safe, that they feel that their vehicle is going to be safe. Um, we did notice there were several lots that there were some potholes, there were some deteriorating conditions, some insufficient lighting, um, and I think I mentioned to the commission before, um, when we were doing our turnover study, one of my colleagues was going to lot D, and we were doing that until 11 o'clock at night, and it was very dark, a portion of the lot. As we get into the winter months, um, you know, it's going to be dark much earlier, and so it discouraged someone from using that, using your parking more, efficient, more effectively. So our recommendation there is a formal program, uh, perhaps done annually um, in the spring. Uh, look at the parking, um, potholes, stall markings, lighting, and uh, so recommendations can be made for where we need to uh, address this and, and make these attractive and useful uh, parking areas. Um, along that same line is the valet spaces. Um, one of the, th the comments that came to us is they're not clearly distinguished. Um, and to restripe those, and there's an example here from uh, Naperville and the valet spaces, uh, you can't tell from this, but they had actually they have, they have a green striper on them. It, it identifies those as valet spaces. Um, they're normal spaces during the day, but in the evening, along with the signage, it helps someone, you know, and all that I'm not supposed to park, but that's, that re that's restricted space. Do we have any specific valet spaces? There are, there's a few, yes. Or just drop, there are, like where? Um, on uh, Burlington and also on Main Street right by um, Gatto's and on Burlington for the okay. ATI facility. Okay. Um, our, our next recommendation is signage and wayfinding. Um, we understand that the village is already in the process of a, of a information, a, a signage program. Um, and we have, again, we've pointed out in the past there's various types of signs that we think are critical to uh, signage way to uh, parking wayfinding. There's the introductory signs that there's parking ahead. There's directional signs to navigate folks to the to the parking areas, location and uh, identification signs that yes, this is a public area where you are permitted to park. Um, along that, with that, um, that recommendation we're thinking is consider hiring a signage consultant. This is someone who would work with the village and the exact coloring, the, the, the types of lettering, the exact placement of these signs in order to that they're effective. I mean, you don't want to go into signage over loan, but these signs really have to be effective and efficient in order to get folks to guide them to where we want them to be, particularly those who are unfamiliar with the downtown. Um, the signage consultants, they also, they, they, they're very up on, on technology and there's different things that can be done, um, you know, with, with variable message signs that might be available um, in order to direct folks and, you know, perhaps it's something you put at the parking garages, you know, that, that changes depending on time of day or day of week or of what have you. Uh, again, that's something that they could they could work with you with. Um, the the one-way streets. Um, and this is another comment that, that came to us. Um, you'll get folks that are coming to a particular destination. They pass it. They turn down a one-way street, and all of a sudden they're all turned around. They don't know where they were. Um, it's really critical as part of that signage program, wayfinding signs. Once they've exited their vehicle, how do they get back to those various destinations? The library, village hall, post office, what have you. Um, you know, and that's something that you can work with the businesses. You know, perhaps the businesses would prominently displayed and they would help offset some of that cost. We've seen that as well. Um, another one of the specific issues was garage uh, signs. Um, right now, and there's a, the example there, um, it's very confusing to folks as to where they're allowed to park in the garage. Um, that garage is actually well used. It's about 90% occupied. Um, but the, the, the signage is a little upside down with level one at the top and level those, that restriction is actually on the, on the bottom level and the quarterly permit is level five, and so it kind of flipped that sign. Um, along that same line is the numbering of spaces on the ground level. Those are four-hour free spaces, um, and folks see that numbering and they're thinking, gee, am I supposed to be you know, paying, paying for these spaces? So to eliminate those spaces as well as on the second floor, which is the employee permit area. Um, later in the day, those spaces become free, but uh, it, it does create some confusion. So on those areas, at least we could eliminate the numbering. 
Um, marketing and parking, that's, just, that's, that's something that is really uh, critical to um, dispelling this, uh, providing the proper information out to the community as to where the parking is available, things that are going on. Um, the village has their parking operations group and they, they do take a look at this and, and that's something that certainly should be consider, cons, uh, continued um, and to use these opportunities uh, with DMC to, to get information out in the community in, in terms of you know, new events and, and making sure that the information regarding the parking is accurate. Um, the economics, and this is addressed to the question that we, we uh, touched on a few moments ago. Um, the rates really should be adjusted periodically. Um, here we're recommending on a two to three year schedule. It gets it so to the point you don't have a huge rate increase after if you let things go too long and it becomes a, a real hardship for someone as opposed to a little more frequent and perhaps a little bit smaller rate increases um, in order to keep up with the uh, uh, rising cost. Um, and along with that, that comment before, the parking is not priced for level of convenience. Right now you can park right at the train station for less than you park on the top level of a parking garage. Top level parking garage is $90, right at the train station it's only $75. We're thinking you change that and you pay for greater convenience is, is higher cost for parking. Less convenience, you, you'll pay a little bit less. And that puts the, the decision in the hands of the commuter as to where they, you know, they want to pay for the convenience or they want to have to walk a little farther and, and save a little money. I mean, it's, it's, it's their choice at that point. I have two comments. Um, the first is why not yearly escalation on the parking tied to some sort of CPI or something. Everybody knows kind of you're going to get increased, you kind of keeping up with inflation versus two or three years where you in effect could have a bigger jump. That's one comment. The other comment I have is when you get back into your section four and you do the comparison of various villages to Donner's growth rates. We're kind of right in the middle. Mm -hmm. But one thing I heard at, when I was here the first time you presented is one of the advantages Donner's Grove offers is the number of um, not stop trains into the city. So shouldn't we really be at the higher end because Metro is in effect offering a pretty premium service here to the commuters, and I think we could probably, if we were more in that Naperville range or up around that Naperville range, I don't think we'd see a degradation in our in the number of people that want to park here. A couple things in my mind happen. It brings more revenue to the village. And number one, the other thing I'd like to see is that revenue then go back into the whole parking, you know, maintaining the parking, you know, working towards parking garage, things like that. That's just the two comments I have. Can I just can I just follow up on that for a minute? It it also occurs to me that uh, <laughs> Naperville's train station isn't exactly in downtown Naperville. So if anything, in order to preserve parking spaces in our downtown business district, we should have the highest. We should be higher than Naperville right now. We have the demand. We know that there are people from communities all around this area who, who are non-residents who come to Downers Grove because of the train schedule. Let them pay for it. I mean, Naperville's the highest one on the block, and they have a completely unique situation. They can park 50,000 cars by their train station. It doesn't affect downtown at all. Right. Every space that a commuter takes downtown is a premium space that could be used for a customer for the, for the business district. I would, I would price us at the top of the heap. That's a great point. Yeah. I agree and, and, and I would push, other than the parking lot, all the metro, where it has to be where we're prescribed to keep it rated at a specific level, those would be the least convenient ones. One, one other quick comment. I don't know if this, if this is kosher or not under the agreements with the railroad <laughs> and the metro. But is there any reason why, for example, the downtown parking spaces wouldn't be very expensive and there'd be a break if you chose to go to Belmont, for example? And that might, in fact, drive some of the non-residents to Belmont. Um, we have a representative from the CBD here, but in past discussions when this has come up, the, the consensus was that the non-residents don't buy a whole lot in Downers Grove. As soon as the train pulls in, they run to their car and they're gone. So let them be gone from Belmont rather than from downtown. We can definitely consider that in our pricing strategy to encourage people to park at Belmont or at Fairview. Especially non-residents. 
Well, there are some aspects between of our resident and non-resident parking. There, there are some aspects of our our agreements with Metro and Burlington where we can't discriminate between residents and non-residents. So we'd have to ah. take care, pay attention okay. to that. Okay. It would be interesting to do a pilot program on that to see what the impact on if people are they willing to pay for the Metro service or are they willing to get a cheaper parking to go to. Uh, Belmont or Fairview. I know what I think the answer is, but it'd be interesting to see what the numbers say. Because I think a better way is to try to convince Metro, instead of starting here at Main Street, start at Belmont with one stop at Main Street and then go downtown. I don't think it would impact the schedules, the trades that much, and I think what you would see is then you would be able to shift people out of the downtown area. I, I truly do believe that. And individuals who, um, at least this is what my family does, um, we park in downtown Downers Grove when we go to sporting events in the city. And um, when you park in a downtown spot near uh, the Main Street train station, you, uh, you are parking there all day. And so if, um, going off your point, I think if we could um, allocate some of those spots to Belmont or Fairview stations, then we could clear up maybe more spots, especially during peak sports seasons. We have been, um, our parking operations group has been brainstorming and working to promote occasional users and midday users that we do have available parking, especially at Fairview. So I think part of it's an education component. Uh, people kind of do things out of habit. Um, so that's something where you're, we're already working on and we can t continue to do and also look at some more pricing incentives as well as you suggested. Another uh, along the lines of those the parking economics is um, right now commuters do not pay for parking or uh, I'm sorry handicap accessible uh, for those spaces. Those are free. Um, the parking right that um, our understanding is you do not there's there's no restriction that you have to that it does have to be provided free. Um, our recommendation there is to uh, implement a system of issuing permits that they would pay for in order to park in those in those spaces. Um, the only restriction now is for on-street parking and only if it's metered in a certain number, but other than that, I mean, uh, a, a handicap accessible permit uh, can be a paid permit. Um, another question was the overnight parking. Um, one of the things that, that came in from some of the surveys is a perceived lack of overnight parking. Um, and it's actually not the case. You do allow overnight parking on the top level of a parking garage on weekends, but right now it's free. Um, our recommendation here is you charge for that parking. Um, what uh, if, if someone were to uh, take the weekend and want to spend the weekend in downtown Chicago, uh, you know, I'll leave my car in Downers Grove and not pay anything. If I were to drive into Chicago, it would cost me, you know, thirty, fifty dollars a night. Um, if I wanted to fly out of town for the weekend and go to the airport, it would cost $30 a day. Well, I'll just leave my car in Downers Grove. There's no charge. So you, you have the capacity on the weekends. You do allow it now, but, but charge. You get some revenue for those spaces. Um, before this commission, we had two overnight parking issues. One was at uh, Belmont, and one was here at downtown on the north end. And what I like to see is in specific areas, where they can have overnight parking from X time to X time, let them pay a fee for it, but it in effect would allow, um, they have to you know, have to be out by a certain time, subject to a, a, a ticket or something, but weeknight over parking, overnight parking. And um, specifically, obviously that won't work for Belmont, but these were people that lived north of the tracks were having parking issues, and they were looking for some parking down at this end of the village, so that's something I would like to see in there. By the cleaners there, that lady yeah. lived. Yeah. 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 She had tenants. That's right. That's something that we can we can certainly address. Okay. Um, another question that came up was was loading zones, um, and I and this is something that that uh, I actually experienced where occasionally. Uh, large trucks, when they're loading, they'll, they'll actually block the roadway, and they, they, they did this. Um, so here our recommendation is consider striking spaces for use as loading zones during perhaps the early part of the day, um, and then which that would be normal uh, parking during later afternoon hours. And the photograph on the, on the slide here is actually 
uh, in Naperville. Uh, these are some spaces that are striped out, and I believe this is a loading zone until 11 o'clock in the morning, and then you can see that it's diagonally striped and it's available as normal parking spaces after that period of time. So that's just something to consider to perhaps, um, and again, this wouldn't be on every block, but perhaps look on a block on, on a case-by-case -case basis where those may be needed um, in order to provide that parking and get those from, from blocking the roadway. Um, rail station drop-off parking. Um, we heard this at one of the, uh, again, at one of the earlier commission meetings where uh, commuters will pull into a permitted lot. They'll sit there with a friend or their significant other waiting for the train and in a parking space that is actually someone who has a permit, uh, a permit for that lot is not able to use. Um, a recommendation here is perhaps considering uh, convert the areas outside lot B right now, which is uh, diagonal on street parking to what we call it, kiss and ride spaces. No parking there unless you're in the vehicle until about 8.30. After that time, it's normal on street, two hour time limit of parking. Um, and then lastly, uh, of, our rec of our recommendations was, um, we did the, the turnover occupancy counts. And we really think it's critical um, for the village to keep uh, apprised as to how some of these initiatives, um, as they're enacted over time, um, how they're working, uh, where there are other um, changes that may be needed, you know, um, and as, as plans proceed. Uh, to conduct these the utilization counts on an annual basis. It would give you how the parking is being used, you know, perhaps where there's some issues and some things that need to be addressed. Um, we did ours in June and perhaps again on a, on a June basis these are these are done. And to kind of summarize these, um, we, we have this as kind of a, a implementation schedule and there's uh, some recommendations that we think can be done um, relatively quickly. Um, one is begin the process of negotiating for the use of these private uh, areas with, uh, for parking with commuters. Um, it, certainly that's not going to be, it's not going to happen overnight, but to begin the discussions right now, um, begin the discussions with Metro for reducing the commuter parking. As I mentioned, um, you are providing more than you need. You know, perhaps there's an opportunity to, to reduce that and convert that to shopper parking. Um, the reassignment of Lot B here at Village Hall. Um, begin discussions with Metra. Um, we understand that there are some uh, requirements that you provide that, that parking is held until 12, so I'd have to change that, but to start those discussions. Um, changing the daily fee uh, until 8.30 to provide that parking for employees. Uh, adding the accessible spaces, again, those are federal and state guidelines, and that's something that you probably should have to do sooner than later. And then the charge for the overnight parking. These are things that we think can be done fairly quickly relatively low cost um, and, and would certainly help the parking situation. Now, some of the spaces that are short term, these may take a little bit longer, but they're still they're not uh, long term recommendations um, or a long uh, time to implement. Um, the implementation of the short term spaces at the end of, ends of blocks, uh, changing the time limits in the uh, south lot, the library lot. The enforcement changes, that may take a little time for the software changes. Um, the conditions audit, again, that's something that may be done in the spring or perhaps coincident with your budgeting process so that as things need to be addressed that they can be put into the budget. Um, the marketing changes, uh, providing the, the passenger drop-off area. The signage consultant to, uh, to work with the village on uh, the signage program for the, for the parking to navigate folks. Uh, the loading zones and then the, the utilization counts, updating those on, on an annual basis again. It's something that's not going to be done starting today. But just, just a question. I thought we did oversell the lots currently. We do. Okay, but we don't, we don't monitor it on a regular basis to see if we can oversell it more or less? Um, what what um, Dave is suggesting is a more comprehensive turnover count than um, okay. monitoring the occupancy of the commuters. He's talking about a, a very comprehensive look at where people are throughout the day, every hour basically, um, how the parking's being used in the downtown. Okay. How often would you recommend that be done? We would, that would be done on at least an annual basis and probably similar to what we did, perhaps a weekday and a weekend day. Um, and covering covering the, the full the full day um, it, it does provide it's the way we do it in a lot of the municipalities and it does provide a lot of useful information you can actually see how the parking is being used both in the public and the private spaces yeah I thought your uh, chart of the survey questionnaires on a weekday and weekend was pretty interesting how it all, all the numbers shifted around there and then on the, the last is on a longer term basis is um, 
and, and add an additional parking garage. And here we're thinking probably on the north side of town, um, as we demonstrated, that's where you really uh, are going to be in order to do anything on that side of town. There's a very small surplus of spaces available. Um, and we say the word garage is because there's really not a lot of vacant land over there that you're going to be able to provide sufficient parking. So it looks like you're probably going to have to go up. Um, and, you know, uh, as I'm sure the, the village is well aware, I mean, they're not, uh, to do a parking garage is not an inexpensive building, so it is going to take some time and, and some planning and, and to start that process with the economics as well to, to build those funds up. So um, that's really where uh, we think, and these are uh, the recommendations that we think will really help uh, the parking and, and, and move things forward.